This one acre plot of cotton in northeast Mexico is all that remains of one and a half million acres of cotton that grew here 10 years ago. The region's booming cotton industry was wiped out by an insect, a cotton devouring worm. The last year that we planted was in 69. We'd spray one day and we'd go back and look and there'd be a lot of worms and we'd spray with something else the next day. And every day we were increasing the amount of insecticide that we were putting on. And every day there was more worms that were staying alive. And it gets to the point where you nearly need a hammer to kill them with. And the most of the sprayed was 22 sprayings on some and they still didn't have any crop. Clifford Brogdon's cotton was destroyed despite being permanently drenched in potent insecticides. This film will argue that it was destroyed precisely because of this heavy use of insecticide, which turned a harmless insect into a devastating and uncontrollable pest. The disaster here in Mexico has stood for 10 years as a warning to U.S. agriculture that its overuse of insecticides is also in danger of creating an insect backlash. The warning has been largely ignored. The chemical bombardment continues. Insects. There are over one million known species, and probably another million that haven't even been named yet. They've inhabited the earth for 300 million years, time enough to evolve into a fantastic variety. Most insects eat plants. Most of the rest eat each other. Undisturbed by man, the insect world has its own checks and balances. But when man invented agriculture, he gave a few insects an invitation to a feast. These insects, now called pests, have been munching away ever since. Man's most important competitor for food and fiber. The most notorious is the cotton boll weevil. This one insect is responsible for more insecticide use and misuse than any other in the world. Cotton, the crop that built the South. King cotton, in the 19th century, the only crop grown from East Texas to the Georgia coast. The economy was rooted in cotton. Sharecroppers borrowed for this year's seed and supplies from merchants who demanded next year's cotton as payment. With no major insect pests, cotton flourished in the long, warm summers of the South. The cotton plant flowers for three days early in summer, after a spring planting. The petals fall and the bowl develops. In six weeks, it is half grown. In another six weeks, it has ripened and opened, releasing its lint. The flower comes from a bud called a square. In 1892, in Corpus Christi, Texas, a new insect appeared in the cotton squares. The adult boll weevil probes with its snout deep into the square to find pollen. The female lays her eggs in these punctures. The larva of the weevil feeds voraciously inside the square. At Louisiana State University, Dale Newsom. Now, occasionally, in periods of heavy infestations, the weevil will lay its eggs in bowls, of, but usually no larger than this one right here, about a fourth to a third grown. And those eggs will hatch, and the grub move around inside and feed on the fibers, the developing fibers and seeds. The boll weevil was an immigrant, slipping across the border from Mexico in the early 1890s. Ten years later, it had spread through the cotton fields of most of the rest of East Texas, destroying the cotton as it went. In another ten years, it had swept through Louisiana, Mississippi, and into Alabama. By the 1920s, the weevil had engulfed the entire cotton belt. In its wake, it left behind economic and social devastation and the song. 
Well, the boy weave a lamb, a little black bull, come from Mexico, they say. Uh-huh, come all the way to Texas, looking for a place to stay. He's looking for a home, looking for a home. Had a farmer say to the merchant, we's in an awful fix. The weevil got all the cotton, left us only the sticks. We's got no home, no sign of a home. The secret of the boll weevil's successful invasion of the cotton belt is its ability to survive the winter, despite its origins in the warmer climate of Mexico. This is a tributary of the Little Brazos River in Texas a rich cotton-growing area. Perry Adkison and Winfield Sterling of Texas A&M University are going on a winter boll weevil hunt along the edges of a cotton field. Uh, we always find weevils there. What you bet we don't get on that today? I'd be willing to bet that we would. I suspect that those boll weevils come out of the field flying in. Boll weevils eat only cotton. In the fall, the cotton harvested and their food supply gone, they seek the shelter of leaf litter at the edges of the fields. There they pass the winter in a slow motion state, similar to hibernation, awaiting next season's cotton crop. Only a few weevils survive till spring, those that have fattened themselves most on the cotton in the fall. I always like to have a few vines overhead. I think those weevils may fly into those vines and just drop you. When the weevil first invaded the south, Entomologists soon discovered its overwintering ability and realized, too, that it was the weak link in the insect's life cycle. Let's take it in and shake it a few more. All right. Today, the overwintering weevil population is checked by putting the leaf litter through a mechanical shaker. The leaves are held back, soil and weevils shaken through. On a metal table, heated to rouse the weevils from their winter slumber, the insects are counted. Spread this out and get it warmed up. See what's in here. Yeah, yeah, there's gonna be a lot more in there. Yeah, be a lot oh, they're more. crawling alive in there. There's gonna be a lot more. From studies like this, the early 20th century entomologists worked out a strategy that enabled cotton growers to at least live with a boll weevil. Its key was to reduce the number of insects surviving the winter. Growers were urged to plant their cotton as early as possible in the spring. Faster fruiting varieties of cotton were developed so that the cotton could be harvested early. The plan was to get the cotton picked before the summer weevil population could build up to high numbers and to get the cotton out of the fields before the weevils had time to fatten themselves enough to survive the winter. After harvest, the cotton stalks were destroyed, usually by hand, but often with the help of newfangled stock chopping machines. The remains of the plants were plowed under. The idea here was to deprive the weevils of the shelter they need to get through the winter. The cleanup methods were effective, but laborious, and depended on widespread cooperation. One pocket of overwintering weevils could reinfest a whole county. In the early 20s, some growers began poisoning the weevils, using arsenic-based poisons spread as a dust. But the poisons were only partly effective and costly to use. Even with the aid of airplanes to spread them, the arsenical poisons didn't kill weevils quickly and surely enough to catch on with most cotton growers. But then came World War II, and a new age of insect control began. In war, disease-carrying insects can kill more surely than the enemy. But in this war, there was a new weapon, a wonder chemical called DDT that could stop an insect in its tracks, as here in Naples in 1944. DDT was as miraculous to entomologists as it was to the people it protected. One of these entomologists was Robert Metcalf. We had a material that people really thought could perhaps be used to exterminate insects and to solve problems on a very cheap and vast scale worldwide, including eradication of malaria, eradication or control of typhus, most of the vector-borne diseases, and of many of the agriculture pests. 
It was against agricultural pests that DDT soon began to be used in huge quantities. And it wasn't long before the boll weevil became its principal target. It looked as if the long siege of the cotton belt was over. Cotton growers dumped DDT onto their fields by the ton. They could start applications without any regard to pest populations or anything else. They could just apply an insecticide every Monday, let's say, throughout the season, from the time the little seedlings emerged until the, the bowls opened, the, lint was, the cotton was ready to pick. So it was just a, what's been called a womb to tomb uh, method of insect control. Using this method, growers could forget all the tiresome cultivation practices, keep their cotton in the fields longer, and pick more, and leave the weevils to DDT. Growers were, growers were stimulated to do this uh, for several reasons. One was they didn't have to worry about their insect populations. They just said, if we put this material out, we aren't going to have any problem with them. So they, they had no, there was no necessity in their view for checking their fields to see if they had destructive populations. And another was the materials were, they were, they were quite uh, cheap and economical to use. So they were making a good profit. They were getting, getting excellent control. And as many of them expressed it, I can go in and get a good night's sleep without having to worry about my insects. DDT and the other new insecticides invented in the post-war years contributed to the continuing revolution in American agriculture, brought about by mechanization, irrigation, and chemical fertilizers. Yields of all crops soared. Never again, it seemed, would they be threatened by insects. Even entomologists were swept away with enthusiasm for the new chemicals. Well, there were a few far-sighted people who perhaps uh, realized that insects with their immense evolutionary capacity weren't going to be so easily fooled or misled by a simple chemical. But I think by and large, 98 or 99 percent of the entomologists uh, got into this uh, situation enthusiastically and wholeheartedly. It took an outsider, Rachel Carson, to first raise serious questions about the increasing reliance on chemical insecticides. In 1962, her book Silent Spring argued, that insecticides are poisons that kill wildlife as well as insects, and that they accumulate in the environment. Silent Spring provoked outrage in the farming and chemical industries, and in most entomologists. Rachel Carson was obviously a very gifted lady. She was a marine biologist. She wrote beautifully, as everyone knows, and Silent Spring came like a bombshell, I think, into this remarkable world dominated by the use of chemicals. Most entomologists were outraged and horrified. I remember uh, particularly she referred to entomology as a Stone Age science. That troubled me a great deal, coming from a rather distinguished entomological background with a father and an uncle who were quite good entomologists. I was pretty disturbed about that. On the other hand, it was obvious that she had hit on a thing that we were too introspective to have seen ourselves, and that was that we were really on the way to making a pretty definite mess of the whole process of insect control. One aspect of that mess was already becoming apparent. Insecticides like DDT kill insects by penetrating their skin and acting like a nerve poison. They kill, rapidly and efficiently, virtually every insect they come in contact with. But a few survived, and it was these that launched the first insect counteroffensive. My first doubts came when we uh, tried a chemical called Dieldrin, a new product of industry for fly control in a hog farm near Riverside. We put it on, uh, went out and sprayed all day out there in these rather meager and miserable surroundings, and the flies absolutely disappeared. We thought it was the most remarkable thing that had ever happened. It was far superior to DDT. A couple of months later, the flies started to come back. We went out and repeated the operation. Absolutely nothing happened. Bob Metcalf had encountered the phenomenon of insecticide resistance. This is what happens. The spray kills almost all the flies. Among the few survivors is one that happens to be less susceptible to the poison, a mutant. In the next generation, its descendants constitute more of the population. After a few more sprayings, these resistant flies, descendants of the original mutant, now outnumber the rest. The insecticide itself has selected out the resistant insects, and now almost the entire population is immune. 
farmers responded to the resistance problem with heavier firepower. Throwing new weapons like helicopters and new insecticides, like the more potent and toxic organophosphates, into the war against the insects. As one chemical lost its effectiveness, another would be brought in. The battle escalated, but the strategy was unchanged. And not all the victims were the enemy. This is a green lacewing, a common insect in summer fields. As an adult, it sips daintily at nectar. It lays its eggs atop long fibers to keep them safe from marauders. But as a larva, the lacewing is a murderous predator, massacring by the score aphids that would otherwise be eating the crop. The lady beetle is another bug-eating bug. In any field containing insect pests, there are also tens of thousands of insects, like lacewings and lady beetles, living off them and helping control the pest population. Good insects that kill bad insects aren't restricted to predators. There are also parasites, like this wasp. It lays its eggs on a plant-eating caterpillar. As these become larvae, they feed on the living worm and eventually destroy it. All these beneficial insects are as vulnerable to insecticides as the pests themselves. When a field is doused with insecticide, both pests, the worms, and the beneficials, here represented by spiders, are killed. With most of the predators gone, there are no constraints on their surviving worms, and the population starts to increase rapidly. The spiders can't bounce back until there are plenty of worms to eat. But with the worm population exploding, the farmer can't afford to wait for the spiders, so he sprays again and again. This phenomenon is the pesticide treadmill, and it's on cotton that the need to keep spraying once spraying starts has reached staggering levels. The boll weevil long ago became resistant to DDT, and cotton is now grown in most of the cotton belt only with repeated applications of potent organophosphates, which luckily the weevil is still sensitive to. Cotton now accounts for one half of all insecticide used in US agriculture some 60 million pounds each year. But all that insecticide is now generating a totally new insect problem of its own. In fact, a new pest, an insect that gets its name from a different crop altogether, the tobacco budworm. During the last decade or so, the tobacco budworm has become one of the most important pests we have, even more important than boll weevil in many cases and in many places. Like the boll weevil, it will attack uh, several parts of the fruit the small squares or flower buds, the flowers themselves, and small bowls and large bowls. It's when they get to the large bowls that they really cause the greatest amount of damage. In this particular bowl right here, you see the characteristic sort of uh, damage that they do. They make a large entrance hole, usually around the base of the bowl, and then many times completely eat out all of the contents of the bowl. They, they can do a tremendous amount of feeding, even on bowls that are approaching maturity, as this one here is. The tobacco budworm, the caterpillar of a night-flying moth, was only a rare problem to the cotton grower before the widespread use of insecticides. Insecticides have made it a pest. Before spraying for the boll weevil, only a few budworms are in the field along with the weevils and spiders. Spraying for the weevils wipes out the spiders and the other beneficials that prey on the budworms. 
Now the budworm population can explode. But that's only part of the story. While the weevil hasn't yet become resistant to organophosphate insecticides, the budworm in many places has and is now virtually uncontrollable. One of the places the budworm broke loose was in northeast Mexico in the mid-1960s. Early in the 60s, this area was swept with cotton fever. One and a half million acres of scrub was cleared and planted with cotton. Hand labor picked it, but the latest insecticides kept it insect free. Laws governing pesticide use were minimal and growers sprayed with anything and everything they could buy. In the mid 60s, the tobacco budworm was suddenly unleashed. A grower who experienced the budworm explosion was Clifford Brogdon. We spray with one formula and then we'd mix up another formula a little bit stronger and we couldn't find anything that would kill them completely. We'd kill 60 or 70 or maybe 80 percent spray one day and go back and look and the next day there'd be 20 or 30 percent of the worms still alive we'd mix up another formula stronger and go back the next day and we'd still have a lot of worms that were hidden by in 1969 brogdon and everyone else gave up the fight with a budworm this cotton gin its machinery long silent is the last of over 40 gins in the region to remain intact the cycle of boom and bust took just eight years and left an economic disaster in its wake. Nobody wanted to buy the land. And the banks had a lot of land and the cotton gins had a lot of land that they had to take back from the farmers. The price of the land went to nothing. Across the Rio Grande in Texas, the tobacco budworm also went on the rampage. Perry Atkinson. On our side of the river in the uh, lower Rio Grande Valley and parts of South Texas, we had farmers that treated 20, 25 times with uh, all sorts of mixtures of uh, organophosphate materials and, uh, and chlorinated hydrocarbons like methylparathon, which is a very highly toxic uh, organophosphate with DDT, for example. And still, the crop would be uh, completely uh, destroyed. Further north in Texas are the Blacklands, fertile dark soil in winter that in summer is covered in grain sorghum and cotton. This is the northern fringe of the boll weevil's penetration of the cotton belt. But in the early 1960s, growers in this part of Texas still relied on heavy insecticide use for weevil control. Typical of the growers who sprayed first and asked questions later was Ray Sawyer. Nearly all the producers would start spraying cotton when it first came up and to a good stand, and they'd spray it every five to seven days uh, for about uh, four to seven springs and uh, follow it right on up to fruiting time, regardless of whether we had any insects or not. In fact, we didn't look. We just sprayed it. One of the insects Sawyer sprayed for was the cotton bollworm. When worms showed up in his cotton one year, Sawyer assumed they were bollworms and didn't think much about it. He just sprayed as usual. But they weren't the usual worms. Well, in 1962, when I had the real problem, I sprayed with uh, the recommended insecticides and the recommended dosage and perhaps a little more. I found that one insecticide wasn't doing the job. I added to it. I used several insecticides at, at good rates of application. And uh, unfortunate as it may sound, I was killing more bow worms running over them on the end with the tractor and the spray rigs than I was with the insecticides. So I had a bear with a tail, and uh, so I gathered up a bunch of bow worms, I thought, which were bow worms, and took them down to Texas A&M and, and contacted uh, Perry Lee Atkinson down there, and uh, under close scrutiny, under a microscope, he found their moving mouth parts to be that of the tobacco budworm. Ray is one of our best cotton farmers up in the central part of the state, and uh, he had been on a very rigorous insecticide schedule, and he would bring uh, these tobacco budworms down to my laboratory by the grocery bag full. And we would uh, test them immediately on the spot and try to find another insecticide would, uh, that would control them. The end result of that was that nothing would control them and uh, Ray Sawyer lost his cotton crop that year. So uh, since that time, I've uh, developed a new uh, attitude about spraying and uh, trying to prevent that from happening again by trying to conserve my beneficial insects. The task begins in winter with clean fields to cut the number of overwintering weevils. 
cultivation starts early in the spring. Sawyer's goal is to spray as little as possible for the weevil, so he plants early too, adopting the methods used by growers 50 years ago to minimize the buildup of weevil populations. As the young cotton plants come up, Sawyer applies an early season dose of insecticide. But after that, routine spraying is out. He has scouts check his fields frequently for insects, assessing populations of both pests and beneficials. He'll spray now only if a pest like the weevil shows signs of building to damaging population levels. He also grows short season cotton varieties to outrun any weevil problems. With these methods, Sawyer grows good crops of cotton, and by preserving his beneficial insects by avoiding heavy insecticide use, he's no longer troubled by the tobacco budworm. I think in the end result, I'd have to say the tobacco budworm was probably, uh, maybe in some ways, could be, be considered a beneficial insect. It has certainly uh, forced us to do things in a different way, and it's forced our... The insect is so severe, it's got the farmer's attention and they don't believe that they can handle it any way except by good management. And I've learned uh, from experience that I can live with a lot more insects in my cotton than I thought I could. Because the previous years I've used uh, uh, doses of, or applications of poison when uh, I found out now that I can make just as much cotton and, and live with them as I could trying to kill them. Ray Sawyer has learned the hard way that it's often better not to spray than to try and destroy every last insect in his fields. By changing the way he grows cotton to minimize the buildup of pest insects, he's found he can step off the pesticide treadmill and still make a profit. This is a startling idea to many farmers, and yet it's far from new. This alfalfa field is in California's Imperial Valley. Over 20 years ago, it was the site of a crash research program aimed at rescuing the alfalfa from the ravages of a new pest, an aphid that had invaded the valley and become resistant to all available pesticides. Despite heavy spraying, the aphid was eating its way through the valley. Robert Vandenbosch was one of a team of entomologists from the University of California who came here looking for a way to save the alfalfa. They took the then unfashionable view that only by studying the insect, its enemies, and the crop could a more rational control program be found. Its key philosophy was that chemicals shouldn't be used unless the pest insect reached levels that threatened to cause a major economic loss in the crop. They learned that even an apparently heavy infestation like this is in fact well below the threshold at which economic loss occurs. The idea was to monitor and then to manage the insect populations with minimum insecticide use, preserving the beneficial insects that kept pest insects in check. This radical new philosophy cut the number of sprays for the aphid from dozens, doing more harm than good, to one or two, maintaining effective insect control. Since the program here in the 1950s, this principle of pest management has been successfully demonstrated on many other crops. But today, the old spray-on-site strategy still prevails over most of America's agriculture. Since that first program of pest management, pesticide use has doubled and is still climbing at 6% a year, despite concerns over the environmental and health effects and despite entomologists' claims that insecticide use could be halved without affecting crop yields. Some put much of the blame for the continued overuse of insecticides on the chemical industry. Robert Vanden Bosch. My conflict with the chemical industry is not that it's, uh, it's evil, not that it's greedy, not that it's uh, overwhelmingly uh, uh, ruthless. It's simply that under the prevailing pest control strategy, uh, it and its products and the way it markets its products are making a very poor thing out of pest control. In particular, Vandenbosch blames the marketing practice of pesticide salesmen, also giving pest control advice. Pest control advisement in California today and in much of the United States is, is largely in the hands of the chemical company salesmen. Uh, this is equivalent to the practice of medicine being in the hands of the uh, drug company salesmen, uh, making the diagnosis and recommendation of the drugs or medicines to be used in the case of human illness. The man is a salesman uh, charged with selling the products of the company that he represents. His bonuses, his salary, his uh, very job depends on this. Uh, it's a conflict of interest situation, pure and simple. 
On one occasion, I know an insecticide salesman told me I better quit talking and get to the house and go to spraying because I was covered up with bollworm eggs. And I told him I, I wanted to see what he was talking about, and he showed me the eggs, and those I knew were not bollworm eggs, and told him they weren't, and he said he would bet me $5 to a donut that they were, and uh, as it, we agreed on a expert to identify them and he took them back and gave them to this expert and a few days I got a letter from him with five dollars in it and uh, a little note clipped to it telling me to go to hell <laughs> and uh, in other words uh, some of the guys didn't know what they were talking about they were selling insecticides. This is the key to the whole matter. Uh, pest control in the United States and certainly here in California is uh, is not scientific uh, is not a scientific technology at all. It's merchandising of agrochemicals. This is the overwhelming reality of uh, California pest control, and it accounts for a very inefficient and very uh, costly and very hazardous uh, uh, pest control uh, tactic. In California, Vanden Bosch and other outspoken opponents of the chemical industry are making a major political issue of who advises growers what and when to spray. In the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, the winter pear orchards provide a glimpse of what may be the future of pest control advice. Pat Wettel, once a student of Vanden Bosch, is now a private pest management consultant. He's counting the insects dislodged from a branch when it's struck three times. A simple way to assess the orchard's insect population. With his partner, Randy Hansen, Wettel is checking the winter population of this insect, the pear scylla. While it looks harmless enough, the pear scylla transmits a disease of pear trees called pear decline, which in the summer makes the trees wilt and eventually die. The pear scylla has caused extensive damage to the orchards of the West and has become resistant to available insecticides. But in winter, just as the females start to lay their eggs, the insects are vulnerable. The scylla are out and about on the bare branches, exposed to sprays. Weddell and Hansen collect a few of the female insects so they can be examined in the laboratory. The idea is to find out just when egg laying is most likely to occur. At this point, I'm removing the abdomen from the female scylla, discarding the, the rest of the body of the insect so that it doesn't block my field, opening up the abdomen and teasing out the ovaries, which contain the eggs. Looking at the eggs, I can determine, based on their color, at what stage of development they are in relation to when they will be laid by the females. This particular female has a large number of deep yellow eggs, which indicates that she may have already laid some in the field. And so now is the time to hit them, but not with an insecticide. When the females are out on the branches looking for places to lay their eggs, they can be killed with a spray consisting simply of water and a little light oil. The oil literally smothers the adult pear scylla. And because few other insects are active in winter, the treatment is selective, killing the scylla, but leaving the beneficial insects of the orchard untouched. Oil sprays to control the pear scylla are simple, non-toxic, and cheap. And depending on how many insects Weddell and Hansen find when they check an orchard, the insects are sprayed only when needed, perhaps once or twice every other winter. This contrasts with the old way of repeated heavy sprays of poison during the summer, sprays which in any case killed more beneficials than pear scylla. The principle of pest management, understand the pest, attack when it's weak, and reserve insecticides for use only when alternatives fail, has worked here to control a variety of orchard pests while saving growers money, even when Weddell's per acre consulting fee is included. We recently contracted with a grower down in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, this was a 250-acre orchard, which in past years had been on pretty much a preventative chemical program. 
uh, after the first year that we worked with this grower, we reduced his pesticide costs from approximately $120 an acre down to $68 an acre, and that included our fee. Uh, this grower indicated to us after harvest that his crop was as clean as he'd ever seen it, and in addition, uh, his trees after harvest looked better than they had in past years. So we did achieve a high level of pest control uh, in spite of the reduction of, of pesticide use. 300 miles to the south of Weddell's pear orchards is another fruit crop that has traditionally been a heavy user of insecticides, the citrus industry of Southern California. But in this region, centered on the town of Fillmore, just north of Los Angeles, oranges and lemons have been grown for 50 years with almost no insecticides at all. In Fillmore, the main insect control agents aren't chemical. They are other insects. Norris Pennington is the manager of the Fillmore Insectary. He's visiting this lemon grove just outside town to check for the presence of one of its commonest pests. The pest is red scale, a tiny insect that settles on the surface of the fruit, making it spotty. It causes not just cosmetic damage, though this is very important now that consumers are used to blemish-free products, but a heavy infestation can destroy the crop. These are red-scale insects at high magnification. Bustling among them is a tiny wasp. The wasp is a parasite of the scale, laying its eggs inside the insects. The young hatch and devour the scale from within before emerging. At Fillmore, they grow their own wasps. The process starts here, not with the wasps themselves, but with a raising on these banana squash of the scale insects. These are young scale insects, crawlers, before they settle down as mature adults. The crawlers are attracted by light, scramble to the end of the squash nearest the light source, and fall into a paper-lined trough beneath. From there, they are swept up and collected, millions of tiny insects looking like brown flour. The young scale insects are shaken under fresh squash. There they'll settle down and grow into adults, ready to play unwilling host to the parasite wasps. Wasps are allowed to sting the scale insects on the squash, and the young wasps hatch and emerge. Ether is used as an anesthetic to knock out these emerging new wasps. The anesthetic is pumped into these cages, where for the last few days, the young have been eating their way out of the scale insects. The wasps are falling unconscious to the floor of the cage, several hundred thousand of them. On the card, when they are removed, the anesthetized wasps look much like the scale insects they were reared on. A few 10,000 at a time, the wasps are put into ice cream cups. They are now ready to be released in the Fillmore citrus groves. Norris Pennington raises millions of wasps a week in the insectary, and he and a handful of other workers there make releases a few times a year into each of the Fillmore groves. For 50 years, the use of deliberately introduced natural enemies has kept Fillmore free of the major citrus pests, with only the occasional emergency use of insecticide. They've grown good crops, free of pesticide residues, at a cost lower than that possible using chemical control. Fillmore is one of the most spectacular examples of using insects against insects, of so-called biological control. But there are other ways the insect world can be attacked from within. This is a three-inch long tomato hornworm, a handsome but voracious insect that is the main experimental animal, the entomologist equivalent of the laboratory rat in this laboratory at Harvard University. This anesthetized hornworm is about to undergo a brain operation.
The brain is the cream-colored object in the center. Just behind it is a minute gland, too small to be seen even at this high magnification, that is being removed. This gland puts out a hormone that keeps the caterpillar a caterpillar. The hormone is called juvenile hormone, and as long as it's around in its body, the caterpillar will not metamorphose into an adult moth. But taking out the gland cuts the supply of juvenile hormone. So this caterpillar will promptly attempt to metamorphose into an adult once it's recovered from its operation. It will attempt to metamorphose even if it's too small to do so successfully, with results demonstrated in another insect by the head of the laboratory, Carol Williams. In the case of the commercial soap moth, the normal insect will spin a normal-sized cocoon, make a normal-sized moth. But obviously, by removing the gland secreting juvenile hormone, one can enforce precocious metamorphosis, get a tiny moth, or removing the glands even earlier, get a super tiny moth. Now, this is routinely a lethal thing for the insect. And believe you, we had to nurse these animals through to get these specimens. So what we really need, as you instantly see, is a chemical that will duplicate which, what we've done here surgically, namely a chemical that will turn off those glands secreting juvenile hormone. In Williams' laboratory, as in others, the hunt is on for a chemical that would shut down juvenile hormone production in insects. If these baby tomato hornworms encountered such a chemical, they would attempt to change into adult moths immediately and would die in the attempt. Here, the caterpillars are raised in their thousands in the search for an anti-juvenile hormone, for such a chemical would in many ways be the perfect insecticide. Keyed to the insect's own chemistry, the chances are it would be quite non-toxic to the non-insect world. Probably only minute amounts would have to be used to disrupt development and prevent the insect from eating itself to adulthood at the expense of a farmer's crop. It is the adult insect, in this case the gypsy moth, that is vulnerable to another insect-specific chemical that offers hope for a new method of insect control. The chemical is one the female moth herself puts into the air from a gland in her tail. The chemical, called a pheromone, tells male moths she's ready to mate. The pheromone is a scent only males of the same species will respond to, and which the male gypsy moth detects with his feathery antenna. Wendell Roloffs of Cornell University has designed an instrument that allows him to eavesdrop on the antenna of a male moth. The antenna is mounted in a paste that conducts electricity and is made part of an electrical circuit. Roloffs then blows a gentle stream of air over the antenna, an air stream into which he can inject minute puffs of chemicals he's testing as likely pheromones. If the chemical is almost right, the antenna gives a small response. When he picks the right pheromone, the exact chemical used by gypsy moth females to attract gypsy moth males, the antenna responds strongly. But that's not enough to be sure he's found the right chemical. For that, Roloffs has to see if male moths will fly towards the source of the synthesized chemical, just as if they thought it was a real-life female. To do that, he uses this wind tunnel, which blows the pheromone towards the males. Once they pick up the scent, the male moths set off up the airstream, following the invisible odor trail formed by the pheromone. The wind tunnel has a trick. Its floor can go backwards fooling the male moth into thinking he's flying too fast, he slows down. When the floor stops, he speeds up again. By altering the floor speed, Roloffs can keep a moth flying towards the pheromone source for an hour or more, enough time to be sure the male moth is convinced the synthetic pheromone is the real thing. Different insect species use their own pheromones and synthetic pheromones are already being used to catch insects in traps to monitor their populations and pest management programs. But pheromones also offer the chance for an entirely new method of insect control. It's dusk in the Imperial Valley. Recalling how he first thought of the idea 15 years ago, Harry Shorey. 
we had a brainstorm. We thought we had an original brainstorm in which uh, all of a sudden it came to us that rather than trying to use that pheromone to catch all the male moths in creation and destroy them, instead we would use the same pheromone to neutralize them in the field. We thought that if we could just take the synthetic material and spread it everywhere in the, in the atmosphere of fields, then male moths would smell females everywhere and wouldn't be able to find them for mating. With a group of graduate students from the University of California, Harry Shorey is recreating the experiment he first did in 1962 to test this idea. First, they set up over a wide area of the alfalfa field a number of small metal cups. All right. A grid of these cups is set out, one every few yards. Into each cup, Shorey pours a few drops of synthetic pheromone. The idea is that the liquid will evaporate from the cups and create an invisible fog of pheromone over the field. To find out if the pheromone fog succeeds in confusing male moths, a trap baited with live females is set up in the middle of the array of pheromone dispensers. The question is, will the males find their way to the females when the whole area is bathed with the scent of pheromone? Far away from the pheromone dispensers, another baited trap is set up as a control. If male moths are flying tonight, this trap should catch some. Now comes the wait, till around 12.30 or 1, when the females start to release their natural pheromone and the males begin to fly. Around the control trap, marauding males begin to gather attracted by the scent of the females inside. Okay, let's go in and check this trap in the control plot. If this was a, a heavy flight night, we should have quite a few moths in here. Wow, oh. how many would you say there are in there? Stuck in the glue spread on the floor of the trap are the males that responded to the females' pheromone calls. Okay, about all we'll get in there. Now let's check this trap in the experimental plot. And this trap is surrounded by 64 of the pheromone evaporators. There aren't any in there. If males and females can't find each other to mate, the population collapses. It seems an ideal method of insect control, but there are major practical problems. Pheromones, uh, synthetic pheromones, are so expensive that uh, one can't just put out huge bursts of the odor into the atmosphere from a few point sources. Instead, you ha it has to be metered out constantly from, from tiny sources placed close together. Uh, and, and these tiny sources, these tiny evaporators, have to totally uh, release all of the pheromone into the air. It has to be totally used. So the, the engineering uh, of this type of experimentation is really the most difficult part. The other uh, very real difficulty is that uh, these agents are, uh, say, juvenile hormone analogs or anti-juvenile hormones are so potent uh, that you n will need very little of them. Hence, you will not be able to sell too much of them. And uh, further, they are, can be and often are limited to individual kinds of pest and are not broad spectrum agents the way DDT was. So uh, from a standpoint of uh, capitalistic uh, enterprise, they are not too promising. Only one capitalistic enterprise, the Zoocon Corporation of Palo Alto, California, has made a serious effort to enter the field of pest control using pheromones and insect hormones. And the scale of the operation, even though it has a turnover of millions of dollars a year, is minute compared with the big pesticide companies. The big companies have, by and large, stayed clear of the new, more biological approach to pest control pioneered here. And not just because the markets are small. It has, in the past, been as difficult to get government approval to market the new, more ecologically sound insect control agents as it has to obtain registration for a conventional chemical insecticide. The licensing registering agents have been used to coping with poisons. And when you bring before them a thing that you said is non-toxic, then they feel it obliged to be more severe 
on the bile rational agent than they are on the poison. But I think it's an educational deal. The uh, great question, I suppose, is whether everybody will go bankrupt uh, before they uh, make this uh, education stick. This is the basement of the Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, where the scientific data accompanying requests to register pesticides are stored. This is only a fraction of the paperwork held here, paperwork that industry claims costs them millions of dollars to generate, and which is a daunting prospect to a company faced with trying to get a totally novel approach to pest control on the market. Until this year, Zoacon is the only company to have tried, with results that make its founder and president pessimistic about the future. Carl Gerasi. The development time between uh initial laboratory discovery and getting eventual regulatory approval is now so long and in my opinion the process is so complicated that uh, it takes uh, gamblers uh, or pretty brave people to get involved in this and they also have to be fairly patient they have to be optimists in my opinion right now developing a fundamentally new pest control agent is more difficult than developing a new birth control agent in humans or for that matter even many other drugs What's needed is a market big enough to make the effort worthwhile. And in insect control, there's no bigger market than cotton. This cotton isn't being grown in the traditional cotton belt of the South, but in the extension of the belt to the Southwest, through Southern Arizona and Southern California. These regions have their own cotton insect problem. This creature, the pink bullworm. The bull weevil doesn't exist here. His place as the primary cotton insect is more than filled by the pink bullworm. In California's Imperial Valley, extensive irrigation and the long, hot growing season produce the nation's most prolific cotton, yielding twice the lint of the South, three or four bales an acre as compared with one or two. But such high production has been maintained only through the very heavy use of insecticides against the pink bullworm. In 1977, the inevitable happened. As in Mexico, as in Texas, its natural enemies eliminated by the chemical bombardment, a resistant strain of the tobacco budworm struck. The top two-thirds of this cotton was eaten to the stalks by a devastating and uncontrollable outbreak of the budworm. A man who watched the budworm sweep through the valley and who had long warned local growers of the danger Entomologist Raj Sharma. It almost destroyed our cotton industry here. Uh, gosh, we had uh, 140,000 acres. And uh, some of the growers, see, the price was good. And everybody planted cotton, and, uh, but it didn't turn out that way uh, because growers were expecting three bales, and uh, they were ended up with only one bale to an acre. And we estimate about $50 million uh, loss. The pink bullworm is the root of all the uh, problems here in this valley, as, as far as tobacco bullworm is concerned. Uh, if we can solve the pink bullworm problem, we've solved the tobacco bullworm problem. So how to solve the pink bullworm problem without using the insecticides that generate budworm attacks? As an adult, the insect is a night-flying moth, and that might be the clue. This tractor, with its ungainly rig, is the prototype of a machine that can paint onto the leaves of cotton plants the miniaturized equivalent of the pheromone dispensers used by Shorey in his mating disruption experiments. Pheromone for the pink bullworm is contained in tiny hollow plastic fibers. Putting one fiber every few square feet allows just one gram of pheromone to be slowly released over an acre of cotton enough to disrupt mating in the pink bullworm population. Because the pheromone isn't a poison and affects only the behavior of male pink bullworms, beneficial insects should be unaffected. The plastic fibers, each containing a minute dose of pheromone, can also be dispersed by airplane. When Nova filmed here, the company that devised the system was anxiously waiting for Environmental Protection Agency registration. Two weeks later, it came. 
the first practical sign that the agency is changing its attitude to the newer, more ecologically sound alternatives to conventional insecticides. In 1978, this new technology will have its first real test in the cotton fields of the Southwest. But meanwhile, in most of the rest of the country, and on crops from cotton to cabbage, onions to oranges, asparagus to apples, the pesticide treadmill grinds on. In spite of the escalating costs of spraying and of alternative strategies that would allow drastic reductions in the use of pesticides without replacing them with anything but common sense. No one is any firmer convinced that of the necessity for using pesticides than I. But I'm also equally convinced that we are badly wrong to overuse the materials. They use more than are required. We can easily, I'm sure, reduce the amount of insecticide used in total agriculture in this country by half if we were to use them only when needed. In the end, it will be experience and economics that count, and the farmers who decide. I just will not use an application of insecticide unless I feel it's absolutely necessary. Uh, I've got into more trouble using it than I have not used it. And so consequently, I prefer not to use any at all if that's possible. And uh, more and more of the farmers in this area of Texas are doing that method. And uh, at one time, I don't think the bank would have loaned me money had I used that, but today I don't think they'll loan me money if I spray a lot.